uh, everyone. Uh, good, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, coming today. Uh, first of all, I uh, would like to uh, thank uh, Southeast Asian uh, Art Academy uh, Program for uh, and Center of Southeast Asian uh, Studies uh, for uh, supporting uh, this uh, seminar. Uh, today, uh, Dr. Gok uh, Yap uh, Yen, uh, she is uh, going to uh, talk topic when talk a uh, whisper ceramics uh, society and life in a medieval novice uh, palace. Uh, for speaker uh, biography, uh, Dr. Go is associate uh, chair of research and associate professor of history at the School of Humanities, Nanyang Technological uh, University, Singapore. She is a historian and archaeologist of uh, pre modern Southeast Asian who uh, has uh, conducted a few work uh, in Myanmar, Indonesia, and uh, Singapore since 1991. Her research interests uh, include archaeology and early history of Southeast Asia, pre modern communication, cultural and trade uh, networks, and uh, early urbanization. She is leading uh, a multi-year uh, project uh, combining uh, Bagan, uh, Myanmar, and uh, Singapore, focusing on uh, ceramics analysis and urbanization. Her publications uh, include uh, the uh, Will Turner and his uh, house, Kingships in a Buddhist uh, Ecumen, uh, Ancient Southeast Asia uh, with uh, John Mixing, and uh, the Militant uh, Volume Bagan and the world, early uh, Myanmar and its global connections. Uh, if you have a, uh, any question, uh, please ask her uh, after uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction. Um, I would like to first thank um, the SOAS Center for Southeast Asian Studies as well as SOAS Southeast Asian. Southeast Asian Art Academic Program uh, to, for hosting me, inviting me to give a talk on the project I've been working on for maybe a, yeah, for approximately six years plus. And so it really gives me a lot of pleasure to be able to talk about it at this event. Uh, so um, the, talk, the project itself involved a research that was conducted on um, ceramics that have been excavated from a what has been known as the palace site. So it was a late enclosure or complex that's situated right in Bagan, uh, right next to uh, the Sri Buji temple. Um, so most of the artifacts that we'll look at would be, has been excavated uh, by the Burmese archeologists in 1990s to 2000. So we have been working on the materials, um, but we were ourselves not directly involved uh, in the excavation itself. Uh, to give some background to it, so Pagan, as probably some of you know, was administrative as well as the religious and royal capital of Myanmar uh, between 10 to about 14 centuries or so. So there have been a number, there are quite a number of sources that deal with uh, Pagan itself. Um, this is the location of Pagan. And the sources uh, comprise chronicles of Yazawin, uh, inscription at Yao Sa, as well as Chinese accounts, architectural as well as murals, and, and of course archaeology. And in order to understand a lot much more about an urban site like Bagan, what we need is literally to look at archaeology, especially in terms of looking at the kind of interaction between elites, for instance, and the greater population. So for Bagan, the chronicles themselves uh, gave a fairly detailed account of the kingdom or the polity, there are four capitals uh, that were known that constituted what was begun today. So the first was Yulunjun or Yulut Island, and then the second was Teripitsaya, that's the location of that. Then you have Tampawadi, and then finally Arimadana Pura, which is also uh, what is all begun, or Paukarama is another term that was used. Um, how do we define or look at Bagan urban character? Um, so there's a lot that remains to undetermined. So one important thing to look at is what questions are we trying to answer 
when we are looking at Bagan. And while scholars continue to challenge existing studies, we should look at the evidence and data and what these show. So important question to consider is do we have evidence to define Bagan in the following way? As an urban site or urban center? And secondly, if it were an urban center or site, what kind of site was it? What type of site was it? So what does our research actually tell us? Um, the framework that I'm using for this study and what we have been doing is, uh, this is the framework that we use, is to look at urbanization and the urban process or, or, or the examination of urban sites or centers. Um, it's some of the works that we worked on or uh, utilized are uh, Fox, Redfield and Singer, but in particular I'm looking at two main ones out of this list. One is Mixic, who is here, uh, that looks at autogenetic versus heterogenetics uh, type of studies or urban centers. Um, this is based largely, or well, to a degree, it was a modification of Redfield and Singer as well as VG Child idea. And so what we're looking at is two types, um, at two extreme end of a spectrum. Autogenetic that focus more on monumental architecture, administrative center, for instance, not very densely populated, and manufacturing on the periphery, and versus heterogenetic, which have few monuments, densely populated, diversified economy, and they use money or a medium of exchange in terms of its monetary system. Uh, for much of it, much of our studies on Southeast Asia seems to give hinterland areas or mainland areas uh, the, cat the description and categorization of autogenetic. But for island areas like coastal ports and all that heterogenetic. What we are going to look at is, well, uh, is to see these two and not necessarily two types that are opposites of each other in the sense that you are either or, either autogenetic or heterogenetic, uh, but rather to see it as a kind of spectrum, in which case most of the centers and sites that we look at fall along this particular spectrum. Um, the other work that will also inform the study as well is uh, a work by Roland Fletcher from University of Sydney uh, look, that looks at uh, agrarian-based urbanism. And this suggests that um, some of these early urban centers, and he was looking at the example of Angkor, for instance, we saw this as low density agrarian urban center, whereby you would have, in fact, the population spread out over a large area. One of the things that we looked at for Burma, or at least for Bagans, uh, or looking at Burmese urban sites, is to also consider or take into consideration terms or uh, categories that is used to describe various types of Burmese site. So here are some of the examples like P uh, or P, which can be country, royal, city, or a board of nuts, for instance, if you use in a religious sense, Baya or Pura, uh, which was found in the inscription as of 1093, and then the most common form, which is Mio. Mio can be Mio. Uh, miu ji, miu nge, for instance, miu to, which is a royal type of miu. And, and the fourth term, gong out, is actually not really used very much. It appears to be used largely in the colonial context. So then the next common type of categories is yu which is uh, in comparison to miu. So in archaeology, we look at different type of activity sites. Uh, so these are some examples, a palace, a market, industrial site, for in some instance that look at production, so it could be iron working, pottery making for instance, port, uh, temple, fort, residential dwelling, or a type of water facility. One important thing to note is, uh, to note is that and all, of this, uh, all urban sites may contain one or more of these above features. So it's not necessary that you if only see a palace site and, um, and nothing else. So you should also be looking at what are the connections among these various activity sites within a site complex. So the palace that um, we have been doing work on is, uh, is an important activity site. And so this is a key to understanding or studying Bagan as an urban site. 
why would it be? Uh, why is there a need to place uh, the AKP or not uh, Jansita Palace uh, within the context of Bagan? Is because we have the materials. So this is uh, a clear instance whereby we have the archaeological materials, we have the context for it, and we still have the remains that we could use to better understand Bagan as an urban center or a site. So questions that we will ask would be. Uh, what role does the palace play in the formation of Bagan Urban Centre? So in this case, we're looking at the palace as a magnet for activities that is associated with its inhabitants. Secondly, a second question that we should ask is to see the palace in the context of the larger environs of Bagan. So how did the palace interact with the immediate areas within the settlement wall and outside the wall? So this can be partially discussed uh, to looking at how, um, looking at the larger area, uh, where would the, some of the, the activities would be conducted outside the palace site itself. But in this particular case, uh, through our in kind of initial look at the palace materials, we are able to, to a greater extent or not, um, be able to detect that some of the industrial activities, and in particular, I'm referring to the production of roof tiles, for instance, it appeared that the production of these were actually carried out across the Eyawadi River, not on this side of Bagan. So that's interesting to see the kind of connection. Uh, so the question is, what was the palace role as an important feature of administration and ceremonial and ritual activities? So. Did it fulfill both roles and did it have different roles at different times? So these are questions uh, that may not exactly be addressed uh, within a, I mean, something they can't address within a short period of time, but something that we should consider, the, the, uh, we should continue to consider over a long period of study. Um, here's an example of what was supposed to be the third capital of uh, Pagan or the larger polity of Bagan, that is the Tampa Wadi, according to the Chronicles. So what you have at the site itself is, is this particular uh, structure, which say that this was the site of the Tampa Wadi Palace site. Um, so there be, this was uh, largely um, surmised from the Chronicles itself, uh, as well as some uh, preliminary survey that is done on the ground but um, not to necessary excavation. Um, so in terms of sources for Pagan, these are the type of sources. I uh, mentioned it briefly earlier in the earlier slide, but here are the more detailed um, aspects of it. So for written documents, we have Burmese inscriptions, the Burmese chronicles, the Chinese historical sources, and um, colonial reports as well. And for archaeological remains, we have artifacts, which are extremely important, um, monuments, so temples, palace, complexes, etc., and murals or and other media of representation. So that is Tampawati Palace in terms of the, um, the map itself. And on the right, it shows you some of the main temples, but of course not all of them. It will be quite a task <laughs> to try to actually work on all the 2,000 plus or 3,000 temples in the site. So I start with talking very briefly about the different types of um, sources. So here are an example of Chinese accounts that refer to uh, Pagan or Pukan. And so this is from uh, Zhou Qifei uh, Lin Wai Dai Da, uh, which described the country of Bagan, and the description said, I mean, the description translated said that uh, the Bagan king and court official wear gold headdress, um, the form which resembles the horn of rhinoceros. They talk about what kind of transportation they use, like horses, what were the residents made of in terms of uh, what materials used, like tin, for instance, gold, silver, etc., and how Buddhism was an important practice. Uh, this particular passage or this particular characterization was also continued in a later text called uh, the Zhu Fanzi itself, um, which is also described mainly the same type of um, information about Bagan. Other sources include chronicles. So this is a reference to uh, chronicles 
much of them, been, most of them been produced uh, largely in the 19th century. I mean, you do have um, the earlier 18th century ones, for instance, like Ukala, as well as uh, 20th date one Mahal. C2's uh, tax, which is about 1715 or 16 for Ukala and 1795 98 for Maha Twin Dim, uh, sorry, Maha Situ, Twin Dim, sorry. Uh, so these are examples of the chronicle. Uh, this is one important one by Ukala, uh, which talk about the expedition uh, carried out by Anoata in terms of his conquest of Taton. And they describe um, various peoples that have been taken. This is important in terms of occupation because another way to look at urban centers and sites is to look at the types of uh, persons who are, who are inhabitants, what kind of activities did they carry out, and what kind of occupations do they actually, uh, were they part of. So inscription itself also gave you gave us some information about life in Pagan, especially during the middle classic period or medieval period. So diversity of Pagan was already indicated in earlier inscriptions. So these are some examples, um, such, such as uh, musicians, performers, such as singers and dancers, craftsmen, for instance, food suppliers, agriculturalists, other professions like potters, for instance, boatmen, canal diggers, etc. So uh, these were mentioned in the inscription as persons that have been donated to temples as well as monastery. Here I will just go through some of this uh, in terms of uh, that they were referred to in inscriptions and other texts, but also you can see them and depict their murals in Pagan as well. So monks, novices, and even nuns, it was stated that as many as 4,108 monks recited Buddhist texts in Jansita's palace. So uh, this is also partly with reference to um, what we were doing in terms of the Anoata Chansita Palace, because one of the two, one of the kind of complex there was uh, supposed to be Chansita's king's palace. Herders, um, the plaque on the glazed plaque on the lower right, uh, of course the others are all modern pictures of herders. Um, Eawati was important was important in terms of transportation as well as other sources like for, for food and protein. Uh, their fishermen, it was an important source of subsistence. So these are depicted on a mural. Uh, this is, if I remember correctly, in Sulamani Temple. And so more examples of the type of uh, water transportation. Musician and dancers, uh, here's an example of a sound player and dancer. Uh, weavers, so you have spinning and weaving of, as one of the main industries. And so an example of a loom. Uh, potters, obviously, and Odin Town was an important uh, mount that was called a potter's mount, and that's why they practice open air firing and you can see lots of uh, broken portraits on that. Lack of workers was another category of uh, occupation. Toddy collectors. I'm glad that they are still carrying that, carrying on this. <laughs> so you can go out for gun and get some and return back to the gun. <laughs> um, modes of transportation, horses, chariots or carts, for instance. Uh, these are also noted. So now I'll move on to what uh, the palace site itself that I've been working on. So the site was named uh, based on inscription as well as from Burmese Chronicle. This particular photo that was taken in front of the excavation site was, uh, this was the first particular MSATP or the Myanmar Singapore Archaeology Training Project. This was in 2014. Um, so the palace in terms of its location, um, is is right there, um, marked by X. So it's right near the Tarabell Gate itself. Across the road from the palace is um, is this particular um, <laughs> new palace site, which uh, was built um, as a tourist attraction. <laughs> so, but across the road is the old palace site, which you could go and visit when you go to Pagan. 
this is the the plan of the palace itself. Actually, the palace site itself comprised of comprised two two sections. One is the Noita Palace, and the second one is the Jansita Palace. So work has been done on both. Um, the 1990s work excavation was done mostly on Noita Palace, uh, and in 2003 they expanded it into the other area. So this is what the, the site looks like. Um, so they have built this walkway where you can go along and look at the various features. So you can tell from these images that uh, there's a lot of architectural remains in which we can situate our, our, um, our analysis of the pottery as images. So here are examples of um, the pottery assemblage that I found within the palace site itself. Uh, upper picture, you can see that it is uh, um, the clusters of pots, for instance, have been put, placed, or rather, they have built a kind of glass uh, box to protect the, the, the cluster of pots. Um, here on the lower left is an example of it. There are other features as part of the elite enclosure itself like this particular one, which could be could have been a well. But of course, there was also another running theory that this is part of a latrine. So we would prefer it to be a well, but <laughs> we shall see um, <laughs> what it would, is. So there are also some interesting features, like these uh, ones here. So these, uh, some of them that are deep were in fact mostly were wells, such as this one on the upper left. Uh, the rest of them, like the round features, are kind of two overlapping circles with a low stone disc at the bottom of these. Uh, these are most likely pillar bases. So they're meant for pillars, probably either make of teak or some other wood, and then we would have supported a kind of superstructure, a wooden or timber superstructure. Some of these might could have been used for ritual deposits, but um, well, that's just a hypothesis at present. So this is the old Pagan Museum. Um, that's what it looked like in 1994. And uh, the bottom is, um, you, that's where the, the inscription shed was in 1994. And this is what it looks like for quite a number of years now, as this massive uh, structure, which uh, the basement of which is where we work. <laughs> and the basement is where we, uh, all the pottery and all the ceramics, uh, as well as other artifacts excavated from the Pagan Palace site were, were actually stored. So when we initially happened on this project, uh, which really is our good fortune to actually be, um, uh, that this was brought to our attention and we were given opportunity to analyze this, there were about 270 baskets of this size and rice or cement sacks. So that was our project for the last six years was to try to make sense of what <laughs> was happening uh, in terms of the art artifacts. Um, as you can tell, partly from this image itself, a lot of the plastic bags had more or less deteriorated. Uh, some of them still have tags, which was uh, paper tags, which was useful because it tells us the location, it tells us the stratigraphy. But there are quite a number that just don't have any provenance. So, um, but what we can do is to try to make sense of that through comparison with the other materials that do have provenance. So this still this is our research at the Pagan Archaeological Museum. So we do our training uh, for about it range between about seven days to about fourteen days or uh, sixteen days um, maximum. Uh, so we have participants from uh, the Directorate of Archaeology, we have participants from the Directorate of Historical Research, and from the University of Yangon as well. And, uh, and so the museum staff as well, so from the curators of the Pagan Archaeological Museum. So this is our research process, how we carry out our particular work. So we first go through sorting of ceramics by material, so this we work by firing temperature, so porcelain, stoneware, earthenware, they are fired at different temperatures, so we use that as the main kind of, uh, way of classifying various objects. So for porcelain, it's about 1250 to 1300 degrees Celsius and above, stoneware is between 900 to 1250, 
and earthenware under 900 degrees Celsius. Then we sort the ceramics by vessel parts, then we sort them by vessel types, so whether they're bowls or jars or lamps, etc. Then by decoration techniques, uh, what type of techniques were you utilized? And then by decoration motifs, this is how we go about doing that. Then we do the work of measuring the diameter rims and bases because features are important. Features can actually tell us a fair bit about the, the varieties of a specific type of vessels, but it also can be used in terms of minimal number of vessel counts, so it will help in terms of that too. Uh, photography, drawing artifacts, then we get our participants to complete this sorting sheet, then do a data entry, and of course in the long term, everything will be placed in storage. Uh, this is an example of the rim profiles that the various participants have to do. So in terms of the, some of the examples of what uh, we see at the palace, uh, in terms of palace materials, we have Chinese porcelain. So the one on the upper left is an example of a town green splash ware. So this is quite, uh, it's similar to the, the one from the Batu Hitam or the, or the Tang Dynasty ware that is now in Singapore. Uh, we found, I think, about three, pieces of this. These are two of them. Um, unfortunately, we do not have the actual context <laughs> in which they were excavated. Uh, but we also have an example of Song Yuan, uh, green porcelain, um, and Ming blue and white. Uh, other examples were from uh, of examples of Southeast Asian wares. So we have Vietnamese blue and white. We also have uh, a fair number of Burmese glaze stoneware. So, the one on the lower left is interesting because uh, the green and white are quite rare in terms of uh, where you, you do find them. And we have been seeing more of them as we carry out the, our research at the, in the basement of the Bagan Palace. Um, another type of ware that is also quite common in the collection now, but not as many in terms of proportion to earthenware, is the Mataban jar on the upper right. This type of artifact, uh, the earthenware, represent the largest proportion of all artifacts we have in, uh, in the Bagan Palace. But it also shows you the range. Uh, this is just a, a very sm small snapshot of what we have in terms of decoration uh, of earthenware found in the palace site. So we have a wide range of decoration techniques that have been used. Had the impress, for instance, slip and pantate, stamping, slip and burnish, etc. Uh, we have different type of vessel types, necks and spouts. And we also have some unusual items like this particular one. Uh, this is a fine paste earthenware. What's unusual is the card painted, the white painted decoration on the surface, on the card burnish surface. So it's suspect that it probably came from or was probably an example of a ware that originated or was brought in from Sri Lanka. So the particular part of the vessel is right at this uh, portion of what would have been a kundi. There's also these under more animatic ware, not a huge number of them, like this black incised slip burnish button ware possibly from Northeast India. And then we have also other artifacts. So we have uh, in the basement itself, the collection of um, lots of uh, votive tablets of different styles and different types of sizes as well. So including this more unusual example of, um, of the Buddha in the sitting, uh, kind of what we call a Western sitting style. And then you also, um, this is an example of votive tablet. Why uh, we, put, we have this on the slide is because you can see on the back of it that's been placed on a, how a text of the drawing. Other artifacts include lacquer, lacquerware as well. Uh, so uh, it's quite a good collection. Um, so what are the implications of the research? Um, so we, in terms of the larger impact, um, the classification or the typology of most of these 
ceramics will allow us to do certain things. One of it is to determine chronology or dating, at least the type of relative dating of the various sites. Within the site itself, the types of ceramics also allow us to have an idea of the type of activities that have been carried out within the larger area of the palace, or what was considered a palace site. Um, the type of vessels too, also allow us to probably draw some type of observation about the differences in uh, socioeconomic uh, groups, for instance, uh, within the between the palace and outside the palace uh, itself, and within as well as with the outside of the city wall. And also, potentially look at geographical uh, differences. So, the types of variety of ceramics are also useful. In terms of analysis of material like clay and temple, we might even be, we can also look at provenance. Where were these likely made, for instance? Techniques is also uh, could be useful in drawing comparison across a larger area. Um, this is a type of animatic object. Um, this we found uh, in the AKP palace uh, or the AKP site itself. These uh, the Burmese refer to this as shadow. And um, these are pottery discs. They are, they are made from earthenware in this case, but they could also be plain, like the ones on the left, or they could actually have design, like the pattern impress one on the lower right. And the one on the upper right itself is actually glazed stoneware. But we have also found examples of it that's been made from porcelain. So these are pottery discs. Um, there have been various theories about what they could be used for. Um, but before I get to that, I want to show you other examples. So this is from a work by an amateur uh, archaeologist who works on Tagal, has published two books that show example of um, Shadol uh, from Tagal. And then these ones on the lower left and the right, these are from Sri Ketsetra. So this is from basically a 5th to 9th century uh, in central Myanmar. And then we also have what is called Gachuk, but in the context of uh, outside of Myanmar itself. This is an example of two Gachuk from Dian Plateau, and these are Gachuk from uh, Trowulan. For Dian Plateau, we're talking about a 9th century site. For Trowulan, we're talking about 13th and 14th century site. So there are also examples found in Singapore, <laughs> which is a 14th century to about 1600 site. So it seems to be spread out over a large area. So um, there are various theories about what they meant or could be used for. Theories goes from them being, um, for instance, in the case of Indonesia, these was used uh, for exchanging food, for instance, at a wedding ceremony. Some refer to this as play pieces, basically, tokens, um, things that you could use as a game piece. Um, so. At the moment, we are not sure what it exactly could be. Oh, the other place that I didn't t refer to, but um, Gachuk itself or Shadow uh, were also found in Okyo, in Funan too. So they seem to be spread out. And, and I think the last time I gave a talk that I um, referred to this, I think they were in Thailand as well, and various sites too. So what does the pottery tell us? Uh, so this are. Uh, some of the preliminary, this is only up to MSATP uh, 4, so in terms of the proportion of wares. So the different colors represent different types of um, ceramics. So blue is mostly tempered earthenware. And then you have fine paste ware, which is red. So what is interesting is, is that, the, as I mentioned just now, the largest proportion of pottery in the palace of this elite complex was still earthenware. So, um, so with temple earthenware representing the largest number, as opposed to what would have been imported ware, like Chinese porcelain, for instance, or other types of ceramics. So it suggests that if earthenware was used or utilized by elite as well, and so it's not necessary. But what you need to look at is then the type of vessels, the type of decoration, to start seeing any potential differences. So what were they used, what were they for? Um, 
they were used for different purposes. Some of it, like this particular type of vessel, or, um, were probably used for um, activities related, for instance, to cooking or in the kitchen. Others, like those, um, those with the spouts, for instance, and long necks for, care, for water, might actually be more related to ritual purposes. And there were other with um, more, or rather the rarer, rarer ones, uh, pop, were utilized in certain areas that were meant for uh, a higher, different, higher degree of activities, not, it's not um, for more daily utilitarian types of things. Um, so what this has kind of um, provided us with is a, type, a glimpse into, um, into how a medieval palace would have looked like, or in terms of how, uh, what type of activities might have been conducted within a medieval palace. So what we need to do, in addition to continuing this research, because um, from what I mentioned just now, we are only touch about 20% of the entire <laughs> collection. So we still have a long way to go. Um, but from what we have gathered is that if we were to uh, go with the theory that you would see higher um, quality items in that, yes, in terms of earthenware you do. Um, but in terms of differentiating between earthenware and other types of imported ware, then um, to a degree you do, may have more um, ex imported ware in the palace, but that needs to be then compared with uh, what we can find outside the palace zone. So this is a this is so a map as well as a pie charts that has been produced uh, based on a very preliminary sort of survey um, that was carried out while we were doing another project on documenting uh, the murals in Bagan. And so it shows you that, uh, in to a degree, you do have um, some differences, but um, for a large part. Uh, you do have majority of temple earthenware in most of it, so we need to really look at the design as well as uh, the, the temple in themselves to differentiate those between uh, the within the palace and outside. Well, we also done a short surveys um, in MSETP2, um, and one thing that we need to do as well is to connect some of these, the distribution of ceramics um, to the various religious uh, or the sites itself, the temples, for instance, whether they conform or show certain type of patterns of use. So this is what uh, uh, we carry out this project between Jan 2014 and Jan 2020. That was just uh, a month ago, <laughs> a slightly more than a month ago, and so that was uh, we had done nine visits in total. Uh, so this is what we had done, and I guess we are very proud of having <laughs> moved everything out of the baskets and the rice, uh, the cement sacks into um, crates, for instance, to make it easier to carry out the next stage. So this was done pretty much about MSATP6, so now we are just proceeding with uh, the rest of the materials. So the work itself um, would be important in, in Examining Pagan in the context of the larger region, uh, especially connection to other areas, for instance, within uh, the larger Southeast Asia region. Um, and in particular, I think we, we have a rare opportunity of having the kind of good fortune to be working on materials from palace sites. Palaces are difficult to, to actually find. So um, we do not see many uh, examples of palaces uh, in terms of the Southeast Asian region that we could uh, be quite sure to ascertain that it is a uh, palace. Um, here I go on to what we have cre created in terms of a ceramic typology for the materials. So this is a classification system that we use. Um, so we divide up the artifacts into ceramics versus non-ceramic items. And then we further divide them into uh, different categories by porcelain, stoneware, earthenware, for instance. And we also uh, have um, what is a kind of bilingual um, 
classification system so to uh, to help us uh, carry out work more effectively or more efficiently. Um, so this is what we have done in terms of having uh, the main main type of things that all our participants should look at or should think about when they are filling out the sorting sheets. And so here I would like to do a little bit of advertisement <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, we all these ma materials, or rather not all these materials, but the, the classification system, the typology, the guidebook, or the handbook in terms of how we are carrying out research in MSATP can be found on this website, uh, which is hosted by the ePress, NUS ePress. Uh, at the same ePress site, there are also three other reports as well. Two, one of them is on Dian Plateau, uh, the other one is on the Singapore Cricket Club, which is a Singapore project, and another one is by uh, an underwater archaeologist on a shipwreck called the Linga Wreck. Um, so far, we have a handbook on the site about during the next few months to hopefully by June or July, I will put up a, a database of what we have done so far. So for all of you who are interested in looking at what we have found, uh, what we have done with it, uh, please do go to the website and uh, take a look. Um, just before I finish today, I would like to say a little bit about Tuan Te. Um, be because, uh, largely because some of the materials that we found in the uh, been working on at the Pagan Palace site also included items uh, that were from most likely produced around probably late 14th century, but we can't be sure, but most likely it's 15th to 16th century. So it includes things like the Martaban jars themselves, the glazed stoneware, the ash glazed stoneware. And so these are mostly produced um, down in Lower Myanmar, around the area of Tuante, Patain, for instance, Mutama, and some probably at Jout Miao, for instance, up in uh, uh, the Shan area at Miao. So, um, so this, uh, this suggests that the palace area or the particular com complex have been utilized or in use. Uh, so right after supposedly Bagan was, uh, was, I mean, well, that Bagan ceased to become the main capital or administrative capital. So the particular site itself continued to be used up to probably about 1700 or continue even after that. So the material itself uh, attests to that. Um, but for this particular part, part of it too is to also look at um, Myanmar's significance uh, throughout uh, the period up to about 1600. So there are various kiln sites and Tuante is one of them. The other ones are Miao Miao for instance, uh, Patain or Saint and Mutama, Nagumbi. So these are examples of Burmese celadon that have been found uh, in the Tuante area. Um, so these are surface finds, uh, not excavated. So these type of ash glaze, uh, green stoneware. And mo some more unusual ones like this under glaze black, and um, quite common Burmese glaze stoneware itself, probably lead glaze or potentially tin glaze. And these, um, this is not from Tuante, but this, um, these are the, kind of the green and white that are unusual, and we have begun to see more of them in the Pagan Palace collection as well. So it's still, um, well, it's still difficult to determine where these were produced, I think the latest word of it or suggestion was it's probably an area near, Pat may for the green pots, uh, stoneware probably around Patain, but this particular one, I think uh, they haven't actually ascertained what the kiln sites were yet. So they're still looking into it. Um, so we're talking about uh, a couple of um, uh, Burmese archaeologists as well as um, Australian archaeologists working on on ceramic, ceramic production in Myanmar, uh, Don Hain. So they are continuing the particular search. Uh, so Matabanja, another common ware that we do find in the palace materials, probably began in the 15th century, but, um, but became very well known to Europeans from the 16th century onwards. So in terms of looking at Myanmar ceramics, uh, over a long period of time from the Pagan Palace materials, for instance, up to um, we, we need to also consider the Lower Myanmar um, part of this uh, larger picture is um, 
it will help us to to determine to to be able to uh, see Myanmar ceramics and classify them into like three main groups: the locally produced ceramics, which can be subdivided to Burmese earthenware and Burmese glazedoneware; the Southeast Asian ceramics that were also um, being exchanged and used, as well as Chinese ceramics that comprise um, porcelain and fewer proportion of stoneware. So it is important to look at ceramics distribution. Um, we can develop a kind of relative chronology. We can also look at uh, its role uh, in determining uh, or informing us about what type of urban site um, the Bagan was. So most urban sites and site complexes are not homogenous. They often contain more than one feature. So they can be can have a palace area. It can have a industrial production site. It can also be a religious uh, site as well. So um, so these are various features that we need to take into consideration when we are undertaking our research. So our ongoing research allows us to draw. At this moment, uh, a preliminary observation that Pagan fits the criteria of autogenetic type of urban site or city. Um, but whether it was a kind of low density agrarian urban center with a massive sprawl where the population are living pretty much widespread around the, all over uh, Pagan itself, including the area across the Ayawadi River so something's probably similar to Angkor, or whether it's more densely populated and does have areas where it's more densely populated cannot be ascertained at this particular moment. So what we need to do is a long series of systematic surveys as well as excavation to determine where all these various sites are. And that will also involve not just within the Pagan main area itself, but also areas across the river because it is quite possible that you would have other areas which may be industrial <coughs> activity site or other areas like habitation site across. Um, so in terms of what else we could do in terms of larger study is to look at um, ceramic distribution of types of artifacts such as the glazed ware for instance or mataban jars for instance as uh, within the, the, the type framework of interaction sphere, just to see uh, what is the larger area or the boundaries that's um, enclosed by this. And then the next stage is to look at the temporal time frame, uh, to look at it temporally to see whether there's any changes and, um, and then to use that to gauge um, the, the, the contributions that's made by these objects. Okay, so um, this uh, just to show you images of the favorite. Sorry, um, images of the various participants. Um, we have quite a number of them over the years, and we try our best to always take photos in the same spot. <laughs> and so um, you can also see by the the length or the color of my hair as well <laughs> at different times. <laughs> um, so this is uh, number five. So we have participants who have come back to, um, um, more than one visit. In fact, <coughs> quite a number of them, I think including one <laughs> who is in the audience today, were participants from our MSATP. Uh, so quite a number were also um, fortunate and uh, lucky to be part of the Alpha Wood project to um, all of the Alpha Wood program so they were able to come to SOS so I would like to say that was very uh, that was a good thing uh, for most of the Alpamese participants so the project is sponsored uh, by uh, the Singapore Ministry of Education um, we have been fortunate that they have agreed to, sp to, to, to sponsor this project for more than six years and uh, we have a lot of people to thank, but mainly I just want to thank um, the, the Myanmar Ministry of Culture, the Directorate, uh, the DG for both archaeology and, um, and history, as well as the various participants and students. And so, and of course, my co-PI who's in the audience as well, I must not forget to thank him. <laughs> and, um, and also I would like to finally thank everyone for um, coming to this talk on a Friday night when you could be heading out somewhere else, especially on such a nice day. And so thanks very much, everybody. And
Great, yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> Can you clarify for me, please, um, to what extent you were able to integrate or associate the fines and the ceramics which you got with particular areas, with the site plan, with the stratigraphy, with the context, yeah. and so on? Mm. Or was there a big gap or big problem in relation to those two okay. yeah. purposes, those two mm. Okay. Yeah, this is, um, there's a slight anecdotal part to this as well. Yes. Uh, so, um, so we have only, we were managed to uh, locate the, the site plan for the excavation about maybe a, it's about two years ago or slightly more than a year ago and so we are now going through the materials and literally plotting them to see the distribution of it so the ones that we have analyzed but not all of them uh, we can't do all of them because as I mentioned earlier some of them were not accompanied by tags and so we are not able to figure out which excavation unit which particular uh, stratigraphy, but for the those that we have, we will then put all these materials uh, and and plot them. Um, so I'm going to devise, in some sense, a kind of symbol or logo in which then I would plot them out on the actual excavation um, plan. And so following that, uh, depending on how long that's going to take me, because um, we have to date, more or less analyze about, I think it was about 40, about 50,000 shirts, but not all of them have provenance. That was the problematic part, is that they were just found in baskets with no other information. So for the ones we have, we'll try our best to, and, uh, to, to incorporate them into it. So. So it was just a rescue excavation, was it? What, a rescue excavation? I, no, excavation. actually, I don't think it was. It's just that they were... The unfortunate part is I, I think they they were looking for architectural features, and they were not particularly interested in the ceramics. But the fact that they actually kept them was an important thing. So we, you know... So, um, and, and in the... Especially with the 2003 um, excavations, they started to take down in information about the actual layer. They even keep information on features, for instance. But the, the problem is because they've been kept in storage in the basement of the museum for literally, for the only time we got to it was 20, almost close to 30 years, 20 over years. Yeah, you can imagine. So that's why the first thing we did was to, to rescue all the tags. Um, <coughs> We write them, uh, we wrote them onto new tags, and we bag all of them, put them into plastic crates, so that even if we don't finish it, somebody else could continue with it. So that's our, uh, that's our hope. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, the, the chances of knowing that the Burmese representation of the beach is that you didn't find any glass beads in the site. Uh, beads. We have uh, pottery and stone beads, but. I don't recall. Do you remember seeing any glass beads? I don't think yeah. we have. Yeah, strangely, we have not seen so any no glass beads. beads. The round, the brown beads, the plastic beads as well. Not in the collection. Yeah, but we have um, we have pottery beads. And uh, and oh, but one other thing that I didn't actually put into here, but in the basement, right besides um, the, the the artifacts from the Bagan Palace. There were also artifacts that were um, that were collected from other sites that was near Bagan, including one prehistoric site. So they, that one has some stone beads in it, but it's it's not from the same time frame and not from the same area. But interestingly, no loss. No beads. Very surprising. Yeah, very surprising too. Yeah, what was the percentage of votive tablets out of all the earth? Because oh, right. I couldn't figure out the colors on the pie chart. Couldn't match. Oh, the votive tablets actually, um, they were all, more, more, I think there's still maybe one or two crates that um, part of the crate that has not been uh, analyzed or sorted.
but I would say it's not very it's not six percent. Percent. Probably not even the same. So it's little orange. Yeah, size. but that was from a particular um you know uh, well rather a particular visit that we made. Oh, right. Yeah, so we have as I said, probably about twenty percent, or down twenty percent is at the most twenty five if I'm being very optimistic. So um, I would say it would be really a small percentage of them. But interestingly they were all in one a couple of that baskets. Were they labeled? They are now labeled, but not before that. No, <laughs> so, no, no, they were just yeah. mm -hmm. But it's interesting because a lot of the, a lot of them are just more of one type. But there are a few that were unusual. Is that typical of one that you have up there? Uh, yeah, that the the one with the so hundreds of thousands of Buddhas. So it looks almost exactly like the, the one that we have in our teaching collection. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, but there were some unusual ones, smaller ones around ones as well. So, yeah, which is why if anybody is interested in doing a project of it, you're most welcome to, <laughs> <laughs> to yeah, to undertake it. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, uh, old school in uh, yeah. the institution, and they might be related to uh, ritual problems or something. Yeah. Why, why do you think like that? What kinds of material you found in? Oh no no, uh, this was a hypothesis that been suggested. So, um, but I think it's, it's some. I think it was mentioned. It was mentioned by one, uh, if I remember correctly, one of the Burmese archaeologists that we. Yeah, the, yeah. because uh, mm -hmm. uh, we did uh, ethnoarchaeological mm -hmm. studies mm -hmm. in two thousand seventeen, yeah. uh, okay. especially on the uh, Bagan villages. Uh, and their uh, housing yeah. architecture. They yeah. put some kinds of, yeah, you know, some, like yeah, coins or rings yeah. or. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So because um, it's it's mentioned to us because we were not involved in the 1990s and 2000s uh, excavation. So that was one of the things that was suggested is they some of that might have been for ritual deposit, but probably a larger number were actually pillar places for. Supporting um, the pillars were superstructure. As to which one, we I think we would not. Yeah, if we were had been involved in that, then I guess I would probably have been better place to to to, to say what were actually buried there. Um, the round discs that you showed us all over the place. Yeah. Um, Possible? Something to do with food production, the making of bread of some sort? Mm -hmm. Green bread? Very small. Very small. The oh. other thing is, is, were they smooth on one side at all? Or are they just, a, a, is it pottery? Straight pottery? It's straight pottery. So it's like you have a broken piece, then they just kind of shape it until it's round. So some of it um, that we've, I mean, the, so most of the ones that are in the Bagat Palace material are uh, mostly earthenware. So they've just been shaped into around this. So, it, so um, yeah, I think the suggestion was yeah, that they were used as tokens, game pieces, or, uh, or some kind of medium of exchange for something. Um, but it's not clear because they're found in various places where it appears to. I mean, it's not found only in religious sites or in palace sites or in habitation, it's not across. A wide range of it, so okay. that's the hard part. Yeah. So, were any found in, in Sumatra? John, do you found any else? Yes, yes, in Kolkata. Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a sort of pan Asian thing. Yeah, right? yeah. Which could work for the interaction sphere thing, but then you know, it still don't get closer to what they actually were used for. Yes. Yeah. So I, I guess it could also be used for different type of purposes in different areas or different of types. Yeah. Interesting. So, but what's interesting, yeah, is that they were using the broken shirts and shaping them to, and you know, they have a kind of secondary function, I guess. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. yeah. So, yeah. So, but so far, it's all yeah pottery. It costs a whole range from earthenware to stoneware, to porcelain. To The, the green white um, light and you drew attention to is there any speculation as to why it was green? Or? Why it was green? Uh, 
Yeah, I think it's. I think if I remember correctly, Neil Tantin suggests that uh, it was. He says it's tin, right? Or copper. Oh, yeah, but why were they, why were they making it green? Well, that why one we do not. Color? Yeah, that one we did not know why they were making it. But um, but what was interesting was he suggesting that the technique for for making that uh, is. Act, I mean. Most of the times when you talk about glaze, stoneware, and all that, tend to say, look at what the Chinese were doing, right, and as a sort of tradition. But in this particular case, he's suggesting that that particular glazing tradition might have come from uh, from the West, or from West Asia, Persia, for instance, because of the yeah. So, but why why green? We do not actually know. Yeah, they're quite rare, but they're just really interesting because precisely because they're rare. Yeah. <laughs>